Good afternoon. I'm Kaushal Chari, Dean of UWM's Lubar School of Business, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Business Ethics webinar, sponsored by the Lubar School's MNNI Marshall Isley Center for Business Ethics. The MNI Center supports an educational framework that engages Lubar schools in serious thought about issues of ethics and ethical ideas. And they can apply as business leaders and professionals and promoting business ethics as critical to the success of the market-driven economy. This framework includes an annual ethics week with a student ethics competition, scholarships, presentations, on the teaching of business ethics and programs for the academic and business community on a host of issues within the broad scope of business ethics. Today's webinar on ethical issues that have been raised during the coronavirus pandemic is particularly timely and we are delighted to have the opportunity to hear from a leading scholar in business ethics and leadership, Dr. Don Elm. I'm now happy to turn over the program over to Professor Dick Marcus, Interim Director of the MNI Center for Business Ethics, who will introduce today's keynote speaker. Over to you, Dick. Thank you, Dean Chari. Before we get started, I want to do some housekeeping on the webinar. After my introduction to, to uh, Dr. Don Elm, she, and she will talk for about 30 to 35 minutes. Questions will uh, be given to her uh, and you can place them in the Q&A, uh, which is on the bottom of your uh, uh, laptop um, feature in, in Zoom. Uh, put your name, uh, how you'd like to be addressed uh, in, in the chat and we'll be collecting those for the period called the question and answer after her talk. We're so very fortunate to have Dr. Don Elm speak with us today. She's just retired from being the executive director of the Center for Ethics in Practice at the Opus College of Business at the University of St. Thomas. Dr. M was to be our featured Business Ethics Week speaker this past April, but of course COVID postponed that until today, meeting, meeting us virtually. She and one of the fellow uh, 2018 Business Ethics speakers, Don Kane, co edited a book call, uh, called Aesthetics and Business Ethics. Indeed, the topics that Dr. Elm addresses in her, her research vary from moral development, privacy, ethical judgment in groups to honesty among her many articles and uh, books. One that piqued my interest was a chapter in, in a book uh, she wrote called The Artist and the Ethicist. In it, she says, in contrast to the well-known rational approach to ethical decision-making, the to approach taken by artists is also important for making ethical choices in business. Being present in the moment, having a holistic view of the situation with passion and emotion, habits of practice and the virtue of courage allow for more complete and meaningful ethical decisions. Dr. Elm earned her BS in chemical engineering from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and her PhD in strategic management from the University of Minnesota. She was a professor for over 30 years at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis, where she was uh, David A. and Barbara Koch Greco, a distinguished professor of business ethics and leadership. She has been the president and CEO of a not-for-profit Center for Ethical Business Cultures, been an independent director for a bank, an IT company, a dance studio, and a construction company where she assisted them in their efforts, efforts in ethics. As we are all frazzled by COVID, social distancing, incivility, and the election, we want to know how this impacts us now and in the future. Dr. Elm's theme is, Unethical behavior today, COVID-19 symptom or cause. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you very much, Dick. And uh, thank you, of course, to the Lubar School and the m &I Center for inviting me to come give this talk to all of you. And uh, I know that this is a topic that affects all of us, as Dick mentioned, and I'm hoping that our conversation today will be um, something that will help us to learn a little bit more about how we can deal with ethics in this situation of a pandemic, but, but also what we can do kind, kind of as an ongoing basis for helping to improve ethical behavior. And before I begin, I just want to explain my approach for the session that we've set out today. This is a large topic. And so I'm not going to cover every single dimension of this. It would take me a long time to do that. And what I'm gonna do is focus on a segment of this that I think is critical for helping us to understand and improve uh, ethical behavior. So I haven't included all of the possible dimensions and we won't be able to prevent all unethical behavior, but hopefully today's talk will help us to make some small strides. The, the goal is for me to present a perspective that I have about how we might improve ethical behavior in this particular situation. And then your questions from the question and answer section after I finish are gonna be another important part of the learning that we do as we, as we go forward in this time. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen right now with uh, my PowerPoints and I'm going to put that into slideshow. All right, so as we get started, let me talk a little bit about the situation. And uh, as Dick mentioned in some of his notes, um, what we're seeing is increasing incur occurrences of unethical behavior in the United States over the past eight to 10 years. Now, that doesn't mean we haven't had unethical behavior in the past, and it certainly doesn't mean that we're not going to have incidents in the future. But over these past eight to 10 years, we're seeing, we, we've seen an increase in situations like price gouging, um, in particular, significant flows of misinformation and difficulty um, understanding what the facts are for a particular situation. We've seen increases uh, in racial and police violence, and we've seen substantial challenges regarding individual freedom and public safety, in particular with regard to the pandemic and, and also other issues that have come up. And we've also seen increasing incivility uh, among Americans. Now, um, why is this occurring and what role does COVID-19 play here? And then what can we do to improve the situation? So um, let me just start with a little primer on business ethics, which you all are engaged in every day. And um, the only thing that I'm gonna mention that, that might be helpful is that when we talk about business ethics, ethical behavior and ethical decision-making, what we're fundamentally talking about is a evaluation of human interaction and relationships, okay? And we're talking about whether or not it's morally right or morally wrong. So we're not making neutral decisions. We're actually making decisions and judgments about whether or not we believe something is morally correct or morally incorrect. And we use the term ethical and moral fairly interchangeably, um, which philosophers would be upset by, uh, but in, in everyday life, that is what we do. So how do we consider these issues with the significant differences that we have in our human interaction during uh, a pandemic? Well, so here's my idea. I'm gonna suggest that the increases in unethical behavior and the acceptance of those behaviors is a function of two major factors. The first one is the significant increase in human relationships and the interactions mediated by technology, okay? 
we have seen substantial increase in the use of technology in engaging in, managing, and having human relationships. The second factor is underlying social infrastructures that impede respect for women and individuals of differing religious and ethnic backgrounds. Um, this is what you've heard a lot about in terms of social justice and all different kinds of things that are making things difficult for us to engage in conversations and actions and policies and all different kinds of activities with people who are from different backgrounds, whatever the difference in the background might be. So as a result, regardless of the title of this talk, I'm gonna suggest that the pandemic is neither a symptom nor a cause for this increase in unethical behavior. Rather, the pandemic is a black swan event that exacerbates extremes in moral behavior, both unethical and ethical. You're probably familiar with the term uh, black swan event, uh, particularly if you work in finance, in the finance field, uh, it's been used fairly frequently, but it comes from a gentleman who described an event in time that is so disruptive that our systems that existed prior to that event are incapable of dealing with it as we go forward. So that is what we would consider and what I would argue is what's happening with COVID and with the pandemic. So here's my scientific graph for those of you that are scientifically inclined. And you'll see that what I'm suggesting is that technology and the increasing use of it, along with those social infrastructures that remain in place, are significant impacts on unethical behavior as we've seen it. But technology and social infrastructures have been significantly affected by the virus and by the pandemic. So there are things, again, just to remind you that are part of this that I am not going to get to. I'm not going to talk about healthcare, for example. Uh, I'm not going to talk about hunger. I'm, I, I mean, there are so many different dimensions. This is a complex topic. And so what I'm trying to do is narrow it down to at least two major things, two major elements that we can look at to suggest that makes an impact on the kind of unethical behavior that we're seeing and what we can do about it. So let's start with technology. Technology has lots of benefits. You can see I've listed some of them there. Um, we have better access to data. We can make more sophisticated uh, algorithms and decisions. Um, we have ease of communication with other people. Um, we have an ease of connecting with others through different apps for different purposes. You can also see that we have uh, some, some comfort whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it technically could be considered a benefit that we have some comfort with anonymity with, with uh, technology. Oh, and I, I forgot to put on the screen, you can buy essentially anything online now, even cars. Now, having just said that, this is a perfect example of one of the things that impacts our relationships. What I just did is something that would be lighthearted. If you were in the room with me, I would have an access or, or a, a, a reaction to, did you laugh? Did you chuckle? Did you say, oh, for goodness sakes, Dr. Helm, what did you do? Now, since I can't hear you or see you, I have no idea what your reaction was to what I just said. So perfect example right here. So I'm going to go on with some of the other side of technology. And this is where we start to have some ethical concerns. Here are some issues with uh, technology. Now, the first thing that I just, I have to point this out, and 
I think people generally understand it as common sense, but we sometimes forget human beings are social animals. We know from years and years of sociological research that in order to survive, human beings must interact with each other. Now, the interaction can take a lot of different forms, but using technology to interact is a form we haven't really gotten to yet. And what we're seeing, obviously, as you, you know in your daily lives, we're increasingly interacting with each other through technology, whether it's a cell phone, a video conference, what we're doing now, email, social media, and with COVID, in some instances, not at all interacting. So that is the start for why there are some significant issues with technology in terms of how we're dealing with our relationships and therefore ethical behavior. So technology issues continue and I'm gonna focus in on some that, that I mentioned earlier that I really wanna point out to you during the talk that we're having today. Um, the first one is that technology can create distrust and it also exacerbates disrespect. You can see I have a quote on the slide. Uh, the quote is uh, from a very well-known uh, moral psychologist by the name of John Haidt. John Haidt has written a, a significant amount on how people make moral judgments and whether or not they make them rationally, whether or not they make them emotionally. And in fact, when Dick was talking about what some of my work has been, it's been uh, about talking about whether or not people actually make ethical decisions rationally and objectively or emotionally or both together. So Jonathan and I have done some work uh, together. But one of the things that he suggests is that social media has become a tool that you can use, not you in the audience, but you as a population can use to deceive people, right? People can put on Facebook um, false profiles who are not, of not real people. You can deceive people and you can, as you know, say horrible things to people anonymously on Facebook. You can also do, I, I think there's a term for it. I can't remember it at this very moment, but oh, got it, ghosting. You can ghost someone. You can also break up with someone from a, uh, from a relationship on Twitter. I, I believe the president just fired someone on Twitter. So social media allows for that kind of interaction. And what Jonathan would argue is that that's because you don't have to have moral, you don't have to have responsibility. You don't have to have respect for the other person because you're not sitting across from them to see what is their reaction when you say or do that. And human interaction is moderated by that when we're, when we're, when we're dealing face-to-face. He also goes on to talk about the fact that um, if we don't trust each other, that means it's very, very difficult to compromise and find win-win solutions. And what we find in ethics is that um, when, we, when there's a lot of distrust, we can't even get the conversation started. And if we can't get the conversation started, we can't possibly make any long-term change. So second, as you're also aware, and what Jonathan's quote alludes to as well, we also have difficulty getting the facts straight. Why? Well, we have information coming at us at, in you know fire hose form from a wide variety of uh, techno technological outlets and social media, um, even the news outlets. Uh, you know, when when I talk with my students, and some of you are former students. When, when I was growing up, I'm going to date myself a little bit here. When I was growing up, when we watched the news, there was a, a, an understanding that the news media was responsible for an obligation of public trust. So they were, they were giving the news in an objective fashion. They were telling the news. Now that morphed into, in, into investigative news, et cetera. And now pretty much everybody who's 
in this session could tell me what the spin is on certain news outlets that exist in our in our world today. And so it's changed from being something that is factual in the sense that there's just the facts being delivered without any kind of additional perspective or if you like omission of facts or shading of facts. So things change, okay? Then, uh, as I mentioned also, we have the lack of balance with real human interaction. The more we interact with and through technology, we're not doing it face to face. The other thing that, that um, creates an issue is something that was pointed out um, by an, art, uh, an author for the New York Times, um, Dr. Manju. And um, we get so excited about a technological innovation that we have a tendency to reduce the consideration of the risk. We get very excited and say, this is the coolest thing. Let's do it. And we forget that there are potentially unintended consequences of all kinds of technology. So, uh, and a good example of that for uh, just as a, a short example is the uh, ring doorbells. Three years ago, um, Dr. Manju wrote about the, what he calls the gadget nightmare test. He said, we don't have enough people who do the gadget nightmare test. And uh, the photo doorbells is a good example. Yes, it's, a, it's got a significant benefit for you in terms of being safe, in terms of knowing who's at your door. There's also, as you're probably aware, a benefit for people who need help who are coming to your door, you can see them on you can see them on camera. You can also see if it's someone carrying a weapon. The other thing that he pointed out is those cameras can also be used to prevent robberies in neighborhoods, but they can also be they can also be used to observe other behavior in neighborhoods. So you lost a fair amount of privacy if you're driving around or near a doorbell that has a photo. Uh, a camera. So simple example. Um, so there's some issues. Well, all right then, what do we do about ethical decision making when we're dealing with technology? You know, what, what, what we have is that we get knowledge or we have awareness of ethical issues that comes through technology or machines, uh, social media. We end up with potentially altered perceptions. Okay. Um, we have the speed of decision making through data that um, can be accomplished very effectively, excuse me, not very effectively, very efficiently, but not necessarily effectively because we may not have all the correct data. We also have a lot of judgment via emoji. You're all familiar with that. Um, we have virtual communities, which we can just make judgments anonymously about those communities because we don't have to face those communities or be a part of what those communities are dealing with. So we have some possible problems with trust uh, and with respect. So that's factor number one, technology. Factor number two, social infrastructures. There are obviously benefits to social infrastructures. We have uh, democracy as a positive moral social infrastructure in the sense that it's designed for uh, equal participation and representative participation and fairness, et cetera. We can have civility that can be promoted with that social infrastructure. We also have a uh, better understanding of cultural and social norms with social infrastructure. That's what we mean by laws or those of you in, your, in, in companies Company policies, same kind of thing. We understand what the norms are by creating those kinds of infrastructures. So we can have, in terms of benefits, equality and fairness through social policies. Okay. However, we have issues with social structures too. We know, or at least I'm gonna argue, Democracy is under attack in the United States. We've had over the last probably five, six years, some serious 
issues with the institution of democracy. Um, regardless of what your perspective is, there's an enormous amount of distrust and an enormous amount of angst about what is democracy and what's it gonna look like in the United States. Poverty remains a significant problem. There are many others. And during the, the pandemic, as you know, healthcare uh, is obviously substantial. Um, we have laws and practices that promote racial and gender discrimination. Uh, and I just have one example on the screen. And that is interestingly enough, I, as, as um, Professor Marcus mentioned, am in Minneapolis. This is a, um, a covenant that was found on a deed in several homes here in Golden Valley, which is just a suburb just outside of Minneapolis. So, and you can see that essentially this is a, a covenant that still exists in a deed of a home. If you buy it in Golden Valley, Minnesota, especially where you're on the border between Minneapolis the city of Minneapolis and Golden Valley. So interestingly enough in uh, Golden Valley when they had a uh, public servant who uh, was elected and then went to buy the house, this individual found this covenant. So it obviously matters because what happens is we have significant potential dis discrimination and there's lots of examples of that uh, and in all different directions. So this was just a, a a fairly clear one. Now, as part of this idea about um, civility as social infrastructures, um, I do have to mention civility and respect because civility is an ongoing topic here and many, many people are concerned about what they consider to be the lack of civility or the need for uncivility, right? So I'm gonna make an argument here, primarily on the basis of, of ethics and, and uh, moral philosophy, that civility is not the same as respect. And you can see I have uh, the definitions of civility from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Um, civility is defined as formal politeness and courtesy in behavior or speech. Now. Granted, the word is derived from the Latin regarding citizen. So there is some implication that as a citizen, you should have some kind of cordial interaction, but this is a cordial interaction. It isn't the same thing as what I would call the, the right that a human being has for respect. That's a moral right that human beings have just because they're human beings. This is defined as regard for the feeling, the wishes, the rights and traditions of others. So the idea is that there's a difference between civility and respect. And while we may call it incivility, I'm gonna call it largely disrespect. We don't respect each other. And that is a substantial problem. The moral obligation, which is, a, which is a moral duty to respect a person, which is to respect their right to be respected, isn't being fulfilled. Now that's a little academic in the sense that I'm talking about, you have rights, everyone has rights. Everyone also has duties. And sometimes, those rights and duties conflict and you have to make a decision about which duty or which right is more important. For the most part, in terms of business ethics and ethical behavior, we would typically find more often that a, a, a moral obligation or a duty is going to outweigh an individual right. Okay, now notice that what I've said on uh, here is that there's a moral obligation you have to respect a person's right to be respected as a human being. But then I also said, there are times where the duty that you have and the right that someone else has may conflict and or both. 
That's what I mean when I'm talking about the bottom statement on this slide. Freedom is an individual right. Do people have it? Yes, they do. Does it deserve to be respected? Does it deserve to be fulfilled as, as, um, a, 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 and protected as a duty by other people? Yes, it does. Now, here's the question. Is the right to individual freedom more important from a moral point of view to or, or the duty that you have to the community? In other words, see if I can say it in a different way and, and perhaps give you an example. Individual freedom is a good thing and we always wanna protect it. On the other hand, there are gonna be times where we're going to mitigate your individual freedom for the public good. Why are we gonna do that? Because you have a duty to the public good that outweighs your individual right to freedom. Now, tricky. We get into a lot of arguments about this. We get into a lot of issues about this, but we also have a tendency to, to get very emotional about this. And what I wanna say is to take a step back for a second and think, hmm, you have the freedom to drive your car. You also have a duty to wear a seatbelt. Why do you wear a seatbelt? What if you don't wanna wear a seatbelt? Your right is that you don't wear a seatbelt, but we have laws that say you wear a seatbelt. Why do we do that? We do that in order to protect you as a member of the larger community. This is what's happening with masks. Do you have a freedom that you don't have to wear a mask? Absolutely. Do you also have a duty to protect others in the community by wearing a mask? Yes, you do, which is more important. And this is where we're starting. We've seen a lot of challenges. So what have we seen in terms of the effect of COVID? on technology and also on social infrastructures, including the idea of respect. Well, we have more technology use, we have less human interaction. It's that simple. The more, I mean, I, I'm sure, I won't speak for all of you, but I can tell you that there are days when I, when I just say, another Zoom meeting, really? Do I have to do another Zoom meeting? And we're all tired of that. We also find that there's more information that is unclear to us. It isn't clear about what is gonna happen with our health, with the economy and with the future of this country. And we're dealing with an unprecedented event with the black swan event, we don't know. And that makes it even more difficult. And then when you add to that multiple sources of information, it becomes essentially a place where you hear more and more and more. It's hard to ferret out what the facts are. It was hard to ferret out what the, the correct information was and the facts were before, okay? But it's even harder now. Third, going along with this, we have COVID fatigue. I know you've heard everybody is less patient, less respectful, less tolerant. We have more outbursts of temper. Uh, it, it is hard to be in a place where you cannot interact with people without worrying that you're going to be sick, they're going to be sick, something terrible is going to happen. It's very, very difficult for that. So we're all very, very, very tired. And that leads to difficulty in terms of stepping for a minute and thinking about what's the right ethical choice and ethical behavior here. We also have more distrust due to the politicized uh, pandemic. Um, the pandemic has been one of many issues that has been significantly politicized over the last uh, four years, but, but since we've been engaged in this, it's very politicized. And as a result, what happens is we see confounding of what we're concerned about in terms of the health of people in this country with their political point of view, which 
isn't helping us deal with what is the actual problem. So again, we don't have the conversations. So there's less faith in democracy and in the future of the United States. Everyone is afraid. So um, I hope that you guys can still hear me because my screen just told me that my speaker has switched to a default and I'm gonna just take a second and put it back. We can so still hear you. Hang on. We can still hear you, Don. All right. I apologize for that. I hope you can still hear me. So what's missing? Well, we're missing some trust. We're missing some respect and some kindness. However, I do have to say that we have also seen with this pandemic um, an increase in, in kindness for people who are working on the front lines, people who are taking care of others, etc. So that is an important thing to keep in mind. Yes, we need more kindness, but we're seeing that we realize th there are people who we, we need to have some human kindness and humanity, which has been a big part of some of the more recent work that I've been doing is how do we make sure that we don't lose our humanity with uh, technology and the increased stress of what is happening with this pandemic. So um, there's some really great sources of information. One, uh, there's, there was a, a great broadcast by NPR, excuse me, NPR, that, that's a misprint on the slide there, uh, the uh, National Public Radio on uh, civility in the United States. And this little piece I thought was an important piece for us. And that is that there's a social contract, um, in other words, uh, an agreement we have about what the appropriate moral public behavior should be and who deserves respect and who doesn't. And there's a lot of people who think this, this contract feels like it's broken. There, there's no one who can say that person deserves respect, that person does not. But we seem to be doing that on a regular, on a regular basis. So let me just flip for a minute then to what do we do with ethical behavior? Okay, ethical behavior, you can see from my little picture or image up there is knowing the difference between right and wrong and consciously choosing to do right. And when I say consciously, I'm talking about you're rational, but you're also emotional and that's okay. But to think about is what you're gonna do or is what you are doing going to be morally right or wrong? And you may not come to a clear, easy answer, but if you at least think about that, you're light years ahead of where we could be. So what does it mean to be ethical? It means you can see yourself in relationships with others. So it's not just you, it's not just your self-interest, it's not just what you want, it's actually what would benefit you and others that potentially are in relationships with you. Again, trust, and respect balance with freedom. We want to be respecting differences. We need to trust each other. We need to work on trusting each other. And we need to understand that freedom is an important thing, but so is helping the common good and helping the larger community. And that's uh, the third part, cooperation for human flourishing. Um, we've, we've had a lot of conversation about what does it mean to have human flourishing, meaning human beings growing and expanding and becoming all that they can be. And in the context of technology, social infrastructures, and now the pandemic. And that is a big thing. So that becomes really important 
And what we need to do is to cooperate to improve that. The other thing is we need courage. We need courage to stand up for ethical behavior. Um, it's very, very hard to stand up for ethical behavior, particularly when there might be consequences or implications for you personally, your family, your career, your friends, your community, your all of those things makes it very difficult. Courage is a difficult thing. And we need to spend a little bit more time saying, thank you for being courageous if you are. So what are we gonna do? You'll notice that I went back to a picture earlier in this presentation. Uh, this picture for me, I think significantly represents what I mean when I say technology is mediating our relationships. And so what are we gonna do in the short term? Well, you can see that I wrote awareness, awareness, awareness. And what I mean by that is that we need to constantly remember that we are facing all kinds of significant ethical issues in, this, in the time of this pandemic. So we just need to be aware of those. And the more we can do that, the better, we, better equipped we are to at least start making better decisions about how we behave. The second thing in the short term is we, we need to at least recognize the dangers of technology for human interactions. I think we know that implicitly, but on the other hand, we're trying to be promote our health and be safe. And we're thinking, okay, there's a danger for technology, but I'd rather be safe and, and I'd rather not have to be face to face. But what we're seeing is um, increase in mental health issues, uh, as I mentioned, the COVID fatigue, all those things that are making it really hard to do that. And I don't have an answer for that in the short term until there's something that's going to allow us to deal with the infectiousness of this virus, except to say, keep in mind what those dangers are. So, we can avoid social media and public disrespect. That, that's a fairly easy thing to, to fix. Um, when you see something on social media uh, or you see something that is uh, that you don't agree with, it's perfectly acceptable to disagree, but you don't necessarily, not you, you in general, don't necessarily have to be disrespectful. The other thing we can definitely do is to share information about facts and about truth as much as possible. That means having conversations with people and listening to their side. What did they hear? What did you hear? What can you find out? What sources and resources are available for what the facts are and what the truth is? Human beings have a hard time with that. We have a tendency to, to make judgments on very small pieces of information, okay? The Affordable Care Act is a really good example. Um, pretty much everybody has an opinion about the F Affordable Care Act, but if you haven't read the entire document, which is 227 pages long, by the way, you might not have all the facts. You might have some misinformation. Building trust as much as possible. Then we need to point out that there are social structures and company policies that don't promote respect and fairness. Where they exist, we need to find out and we need to suggest that there might be a need for change. That again, very hard. Systems do not change easily. There's a lot of inertia. And um, I'd be naive if I thought we could change social structures in short periods of time. We can change company policies in shorter periods of time because we're dealing with a smaller population of people. And there's an opportunity there, a lot of business ethicists would say, for corporations and companies to take leadership in doing this kind of thing. Then we need to appreciate the trade-off between individual freedom and the good of the community, as I mentioned before. And the last thing I put up there uh, in bold is that we need to actually call out unethical behavior. Um, we have something here in Minnesota that we call Minnesota nice. 
you might, you might have heard of it. And what it means is people are very uh, conflict avoidant. And in general, what they do is they say, yeah, I, I don't agree with you, but I'm not going to tell you that. Um, instead, I'm going to go tell everyone else that I disagree with you. And some other people call that passive aggressive. Okay. My point is there comes a time where you have to say, yeah, that's not particularly good behavior. And we need to point that out. So that's short term, long term. Awareness, 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 awareness never goes away because it changes how you interact in your world, not only with technology and, and social infrastructures, but with everyone that you have a relationship with. It also um, allows you to be more open to having conversations about things that you and others might disagree about. Encourage the lost art of face-to-face -face communication. We won't be able to do this until we're out of this particular pandemic and we have this virus under control. But it's still a concern for the, the way we're developing technology to remember that humans need to interact face to face. Then the next thing that we can do is we can, we can work on creating technology that enhances human interactions and doesn't replace them. This is um, a slightly different issue from what I was talking about in terms of our interactions being mediated by technology. Um, this also morphs into uh, technology replacing human beings in the workplace or for certain uh, jobs and, and uh, careers. Obviously, we need to respect and trust each other. Again, ongoing, ongoing. We do need to change social structures and company policies that don't promote respect and fairness. And um, social change takes a long time. But it can be done if it needs to be done. We need to call out unethical behavior. No surprise that I would put it there all the time. And we need to be kind to one another. So that is my solution, my suggestion. And I just finish with, you know, let's be kind to each other. We're, we're all in this together. And hopefully some of the things that I've suggested have spurred some ideas for you or some conversations that you might wanna have and we can go from there. Dick, I will hand it back over to you for a second here and I'll stop. Thank you very much. I loved all the pictures in your presentation and uh, the distinctions between um, the idea of uh, civility versus respect. But there are a number of questions that I would like to, to um, bring that people have, have given. One, uh, Chris Wesley says, Dawn, why do you think there are increases in price gouging incidences in the most recent eight to 10 years compared to say the eight to 10 years before that? Um, I think that increases in price gouging are, uh, and over the, the last eight to 10 years, We've seen, we've seen that for two reasons. One has been the uh, decreased competitiveness of the United States in a global economy. We are not as competitive as we used to be in uh, the global economy. And I think that has led to uh, businesses here suggesting that there's only one way to survive and potentially it could be through price gouging. The other thing that I think has happened specifically more recently with the pandemic is very much people are, are everyone is scared about their economic well-being. So as a result, what's happening is there are some businesses who are taking advantage of that and saying, um, I'm going to increase the price of a product that I might have sold for a uh, hundred bucks now because I might not sell as many, I I'm, I'm, might be going out of business, I, I'm gonna sell it for 250 bucks and see what I can do. So that's that's what I would say to that. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question myself. Uh, most Netflix shows now feature 
all of George Carlin's seven words that you can never say on television, uh, they, they tend to be demeaning and hurt people with the, uh, their use, um, but they're being used all the time. Is this the coarsening of our language a symptom of what you are addressing or just a natural part of language that changes over time? That's a really good question. Um, first of all, let me answer I'm gonna answer it two ways. The first answer I'm gonna give is that um, comedy, which is what George Carlin represents, which by the way, you and I are, I mean, there may be people in this audience, there are younger people in this audience who are going, what, what are they talking about? <laughs> um, and comedy I think is um, exempt from the kind of thing that I was talking about in terms of uh, civility and, and respect. And the reason I say that is comedy is designed to be um, tension relieving. And we will, we will in, generally, in general say, okay, you can, you can say that. Now, uh, having said that with comics, um, a lot of comedy, stand-up comedy is significantly obnoxious with the use of those seven words. And that's long-term. I mean, there are comics back from the 1960s and 1970s. If you listen to their standup, wow, you might be offended by that, okay? But outside of uh, comedy, I think that the, the language that we use is not necessarily becoming more coarse. I think we're becoming more aware of it. And my, my argument would be we're becoming more aware of it because of technology. You can now see it on Netflix. You can hear it um, on YouTube. You can, you can see it on social media. So that means it's still, it's very much there. Um, and although that's a part of what I would call disrespect in terms of language, the other thing that we've seen is people call each other names. There are, there's a lot of name calling happening, regardless of where you are, who you are. There's, and they're, and they're just, they're, I guess labels is probably a good way to describe it. Not necessarily obscenities, but labels. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Um, when uh, the Federal Reserve measures how much money is in circulation in um, an, a region, and it's usually used as a proxy for how much illegal activity is going on so that there is more currency circulating, let's say, in uh, Florida and Miami than there is in Minnesota. Uh, but what are some of the ways we can see unethical behavior or incivility increasing either, either in this crisis over or over the last eight years? Um, let me make sure I understand what you're asking. Are you asking, is there some way to Any measure way to it? to measure it, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, how can we measure it? Hmm. Probably, um, we don't have a, official measures, which is a very interesting, uh, is a very interesting point in and of itself. The way that I would suggest we measure it is by looking at the interactions that we see in uh, primary sources of technological communication or media. So we could start, for example, looking at um, what is being uh, used in terms of language and conversation on television, um, on the news. Um, and you know, when you say Netflix, uh, that may be partly, uh, uh, we could partly have a measure for that. The other thing is we have so many, so much anecdotal evidence about disrespect. It becomes extremely difficult to measure uh, because it happens once here, once there, here, there, then, now. And as a result, we don't have any official measure for that. So I don't know that I've got a great answer for that, Dick, but we could start really looking at, you know, I mean, another, perhaps I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate for this. Okay. But an extreme measure would be, we start censoring uh, what 
the media says and what what people can say on television. You might remember, Dick, you and I might remember that there used to be times where you couldn't advertise a product. You couldn't you couldn't advertise a product in marketing by name on television. You actually had to say Pro our product is better than product X. And that was a requirement for you to actually have an advertisement that, that was a competitive claim. Now, the argument against that, of course, is going to be is going to be the freedom argument, right? So that's going to be probably an in between. I think I'll ask one one uh, last question, and then the dean wants to to greet us at the end. Um, we know we've had other pandemics: SARS, Ebola, Spanish flu, going back uh, more than 100 years. With a world with more people and more travel likelihood of pandemics is higher than it was. Do you think we have learned anything from this pandemic for future pandemics? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think we've learned something. Uh, I think every time we have a pandemic, we learn a little bit more about how well our systems and infrastructures can handle this level of uncertainty. And I think, and again, I'm gonna go back to what I was saying in, in the talk, Dick, that I'm, I would say that technology has significantly impacted not only what we've learned, but also impeded what we've been able to do with this pandemic. And so, we're not going to go back to normal. Uh, and I don't even know what normal is going to be. I do know that while we've learned a lot, we're going to continue to learn because this is a perfect example of something that we had no idea how to do this. And we're still reeling with that. So we're getting better and we're getting better, but I think we'll learn from it. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dr. Alm, for your very insightful presentation today. Uh, the pandemic is certainly a black swan event that has really impacted the whole world in ways that we could have ever imagined. And bringing into focus, uh, you know, ethical issues uh, that uh, we need to deal with. And uh, it's been a great conversation that you have had. And on behalf of the Lubar School of Business and the MNI Center for Business Ethics, I would like to thank uh, you for, uh, for the presentation. And I would like to thank everyone uh, for attending this event. Now to the audience, if you would like to register for additional upcoming webinars uh, offered by the Lubar School, uh, please do visit our website, lubar.uwm.edu. With that, have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.